Yeah, welcome after the break for my talk about Linux kernel locking engineering. I'm Daniel Wetter. And, oh, maybe room order first, if we can compress a bit because people are still walking in. That might be nice. Thanks a lot. Because it seems quite packed. Yeah, so, uh, I guess the first question, and it serves as a nice introduction, is, is like, why this talk? What's, what's my goal, at least here? And I've been doing uh, kernel maintaining in the graphics subsystem for over 10 years now, first in, uh, for the Intel graphics driver since a few years as, as co maintainer together with Dave Verley for the entire subsystem. And uh, graphics has grown quite tremendously over the last 10, 15 years. We've uh, got a lot of drivers, we had to add a lot of features, we had to re architect a lot of code. And fairly often the locking turned out to be a mistake. And uh, so over all these drivers, and, and I mean some of these drivers were like locking, what, what do I need this for, like my display lights up, this should be good enough. Um, all the way to why certain locking patterns and design approaches are kind of hard to debug, hard to maintain, hard to refactor. And over the past few years, I've somehow become the person that gets approached every time someone has a lock depth splat in the, in the graphics driver. So a bit by self-fulfilling uh, prophecy, I've, I've become the, the locking expert. And I've tried to like distill all the, the lessons learned from the specific cases over the last few years into kind of... Uh, more abstract patterns and anti-patterns and principles. And this entire topic here started out as some internal trainings uh, a few years ago. Um, last year, I uh, finally got around to write it up into a blog post. So those are the two links. The slides are on chget.com, so you don't have to take pictures. And that's also like the structure of the talk. It's, it's essentially two, two parts. First. Uh, a little bit about more general principles that are overarching over all the all the different patterns and challenges, and the second one is really a collection of kind of locking design engineering patterns, uh, a bit structured into a hierarchy, starting with the easiest to understand, easiest to debug, and and easiest to refactor and like combine down to the ones that you really only should use when you've uh, exhausted all other options. Um, so th that, that's going to be the rough structure. So to start off, let's, let's look at some of, of the principles that I, I kind of distilled from all these bad examples and some of the good ones that I think we had. And the first is like, what, what should be the priority in, in locking design? And the absolute first one is, is make it simple. Like debugging broken code is hard. Debugging broken locking is much harder. And yes, we have like toolings like dock depth splats and the new uh, memory race uh, sanitizer in the kernel. And in, I think it's KUV san or something. I forgot the exact name. And all these tools that help you find bugs kind of before uh, they burn up in production. But essentially, uh, my rule of thumb is if, if you get, like, get a lock depth splat or some deadlock from a customer or whatever, and it's not immediately obvious to you what's wrong, then your locking's too clever, and you need to make it like dumber. Uh, it might not be obvious at all what you need to fix, right? Like, that, that's an entire different story. Sometimes you realize, oh, this is going to be two years of refactoring until we can actually fix this. But it should be, the, the locking should be so simple that when you get a bug, it should be pretty much immediately obvious what was wrong. Uh, otherwise, like, it, it, it just gets too hard. And there's so many cases of like driver alters coming with lock depth splats and have no idea what's, what's even wrong. Uh, the second priority, once you've made it simple enough that you can actually fi fix bugs in there, right? you should maybe try to make it correct. Like, 
that's well, really, uh, like this. This is a bit like over the top and cynic, right? But I really think if you if you try to make it correct before you've made it really simple, you've probably screwed yourself already into a corner. <laughs> And then, once you've made it correct, and like the box are at, and the kernel doesn't crash, and the driver generally does the right thing, then, and only then, can you look at making it fast. And only like fast enough. So, the, the making it simple should be pretty clear. Or at least, it's, yeah, like if, if, you, if you don't understand the bug reports, it's just too complex. That, that's kind of my rule of thumb. But let's look at the other two a bit. So making it correct, right? The, the first rule there, and, and they even wrote a bunch of mailing list rants and blog posts on this, is design for locked up, never against it. Like, if you get a locked up splat and analyze it, and then conclude whether it's correct or not, or whether you're right or not, that locked up is wrong, and like your design doesn't deadlock, but locked up doesn't understand it, then um, maybe your code is correct, but your design is wrong, right? So locked up through, through these classes where it kind of groups locks together and just tries to find deadlocks among entire classes of locks forces you to have a locking design where the rules don't change, right? So you can't have like an object that has like locking rules uh, like A nests and B, and then later on it nests the other way around. So you, you can make this correct, but LockDeb will not understand it. And so LockDeb, in a way, really forces you to make a locking design that's that's a lot simpler, and so it kind of feeds back in, into the first priority. Uh, kind of related to that, um, avoid fancy LockDeb annotations like the nesting and that kind of stuff, because you can actually then, in, in those cases, you can have deadlocks and locked up says this is good, and your kernel has actually deadlocks, right? <laughs> and so those, those annotations are very dangerous. You really, like, you should use, like, the standard locks with their annotations as they are, and as soon as you start shoveling around with locked up keys and locked up classes and nesting orders, you, you, you're very much in like dangerous territory. Um, another thing that I think is really good is like documentation is cool, but executable documentation is better. So with complex locking nesting, uh, what, what we've done in a bunch of cases in graphics is for the case of config locked up, we just run a function at module load, which takes all the important locks in the right order, so that whenever you load a driver, you, you never have like the case that like driver A has a certain nesting, and driver B has it the other way around. And you, you, this way you can enforce that across the subsystem, even if tr people never load like more than one driver, which is the usual case with graphics, uh, you, you don't end up with an inconsistent locking order. So I think priming the, lo the, lo the, the locking order when config locked up enabled is, is really good. Uh, this is especially important in the memory management side in graphics, where we have interactions with shrinkers and the memory mapping semaphores and all these things, but really like the, the graphics lock need to be exactly in the right uh, slots fitting into the overall uh, memory management locking hierarchy. And the other things to, to make uh, locking correct is all the annotations you can sprinkle over, the, uh, over your code. So, uh, especially when you have like fast pass, where you take certain locks only in the slow path, then might lock is a really nice annotation because it makes sure that you always pretend you're taking the slow pass. The same with might sleep, right? Uh, the, a fairly new one that I added, I think a year or two ago, is might alloc, especially when you're interacting with the memory management subsystem, either with page fault handler or with your own shrinker or with MMU notifiers, then might alloc is, is 
pulls in the entire memory reclimb hierarchy. And of course, like if you have functions that assume that certain locks are held, then lock that asset held is your friend. So these are kind of like essentially use lock that to, to prove your design and make, make sure everyone follows it. Uh, tricks to, to make your locking correct. Uh, still on the topic of making your locking correct, um, don't invent your own locking primitives. Like, seriously. <laughs> I mean, for, for one is, uh, you're pretty much guaranteed to make the Linux RT people unhappy. You're also pretty much guaranteed to get the lock dev annotations wrong, if you even think about adding them. And I mean, th th this extends to concurrency primitives in general, because when you don't have locks, but like, for example, comp weight completion or things like that, you, you also need memory barriers, right? For like handing over or synchronizing access to data. Um, that's really the hard part. Like, I think we in invented two, three of our own synchronization primitives in, in the RAM, and they're all wrong with respect to memory barriers. Uh, so th this is this is this is really hard. The the next thing is like in so so use the existing locks because a lot of people have thought a lot about what they exactly mean, what are the precise semantics, what barriers need to be included, what's the red lock the annotation, how do the semantics change when you enable real time Linux, all these things. The the next one is kind of pick pick the simplest possible lock or lock design because generally the, the, the rules are stricter, and so you catch bugs quicker. So if you can use a simple spin lock, then that's better than a mutex, or like a spin lock is better than a read-write mutex if you don't need it, because there's kind of less things you're allowed to do and, and more things that lock that can catch for you. And the same thing with, with concurrency and synchronization primitives. So when, when like flush work or flush work queue is the right thing for you, then don't invent your own thing with like completions or a wait queue. Because flush work queue has annotations in lock that and when you create certain deadlock scenarios where your worker is waiting for a lock and you're holding that lock while you wait for that worker, right? Then lock that will complain. But if you roll your own locking and uh, uh, your own uh, synchronization primitives with wait queues or completion, then lock that will say this is, looks good and it deadlocks uh, in production. And final, kind of the last priority, right, is make it fast or really only make it fast enough because the first question you should ask, does it really need to be fast? Like in the graphics driver with the, the mode setting code, displays refresh at 60 frames per second. So if, you, if your code's fast enough to do a few thousand updates per second, like it's, it's good. <laughs> You're already way faster than it needs to be. And the next one is like only use real workloads to justify performance tuning, not micro benchmarks. Micro benchmarks are good to like, once you've identified a problem, make sure you make forward progress and you don't regress anything else. Like, they're good for that, uh, but they're not good to justify complexity. And one thing that is maybe a bit specific to GPUs, but like we've seen it in other places too, are very much like the, an overall better architecture. It gives you so much more benefits than trying to microtune the locking. So the big model there is, is the, uh, the Vulkan GPU model instead of OpenGL. It's just like that's actually how GPUs work nowadays, and OpenGL is kind of how GPUs worked in the 90s. And, and it just doesn't fit anymore. And I think another great example is the, the POSIX file I.O. API versus I.O. U-Ring. And one of them is just fundamentally faster, and there's, there's no amount of like clever locking tricks. So, that you can apply to the POSIX file I.O. API to get to the same level as, as I.O. U-Ring. So th those are kind of the priorities. Uh, the next uh, principle 
and this kind of ties into why you should follow lock that but not fight it, is you should protect data, not code. Um, so protecting data here essentially means you, you build your data structures, like your structs and whatever, and then when you need to protect some mutable member in there, you have like one row that holds for all the code how that struct member is protected by which lock or which rule or, or whatever it is, right? And then what this means is for review and testing, essentially all you have to do is in testing with like these locked up annotations and review by well, reading the code is compare all the code against these single locking rules, right? But if you like go the other way and kind of just protect the code against each and other, like with state transitions, where the locking rule changes and other fancy things like that. What you have to do with testing is you have to test all the pieces against all the others, and the same with review, and that just doesn't scale. A another kind of example of, of protecting code and not data is when you say, you don't care about performance and just do one lock for the entire subsystem. <laughs> that tends to be a maintainability nightmare. And it's, it's, it's again like in a way if you just protect all the code in the subsystem, you could say all, oh, protect all the data structures in the subsystem. But it's, it's really more like protecting the, all the code in your subsystem with one kind of big kernel lock or subsystem specific kernel lock. And so, so this is kind of um, why, why lockdep pushes you in the right direction, because when you initialize the st a structure and its mutex, uh, the way lockdep works, it forces all the mutexes for that structure, assuming you have like a single initialization function for this, like you should, uh, into the same lockdep class. And so lockdep ensures that for a given data structure, a given, given piece of data, that you always follow up the same rules anywhere in the code uh, for, you, for your given piece of data. Uh, unfortunately, there's some, some anti-patterns. I think the one that's been most painful for us in graphics is kref put mutex. Uh, so kref put mutex is like a normal kref put, except when you do the final unref, before it does that, it grabs this mutex. And this allows you to protect uh, like weak references in lookup structures and other places by this mutex. And when you do kind of these cache lookups, right, you can grab the mutex, you can look up your object or whatever it is, and you guarantee that as long as it's kind of still under the protection of that mutex, the reference can is at least one, because the, the, the final release function is guaranteed to, to like, the final unref is always done on this mutex, and the release function can then remove all the, all the caching and, and lookup caches, entries from all the places. Now the problem is, this, this kind of protects not the data structure, but it protects you against the release function. Uh, and the way this tends to hurt you is, what happens if you have like two lookup caches with different mutexes? At that point, you lead like kref put mutex mutex, right? And maybe another one, so it, it doesn't compose. The next one is that uh, your mutex tends to become really big because you need to hold it through your entire release function, and there might be all kinds of things you need to clean up while you're holding this mutex, which increases the odds that, that you're, you're facing a deadlock. So that's kind of the, the, the second principle. And um, with the principles out of the way, let's, uh, let's dive into kind of the, the different patterns I've seen and try to extract a bit. And uh, I've tried to put them, like I said, I've tried to put them a bit in a hierarchy from like most maintainable, easiest to debug to you, you, you're going to be in pain. And uh, I mean, this is just the overview. Like the first one is like, you don't have locks, you have other clever solutions for that. The next one is just big dumb lock for like every 
data structure has its own lock. So this is not like the big kernel lock, subsystem lock thing. That's that's too big. And then in certain like scenarios, you need more fine-grained locking for functionality. That's already getting complicated. And then the danger zone starts when you do fine-grained locking for performance. <laughs> and then really annoying is when you start applying lockless tricks and inventing your own locking or synchronization and consistency primitives. So let's look at the first one. This, this is like any time you can solve a, a data consistency problem with one of these, you should. And the, I think the most pow powerful pattern here is immutable state, as in you create an object and then you publish it by putting it into a, an X array for lookup or adding a file descriptor slot for it or whatever it is, right? And from that point on, you never ever change it again, which means there's no synchronization primitives. And this is essentially the difference between OpenGL and Vulkan. So Vulkan, almost everything is just immutable state and is really fast and it's really easy and it allows you to do uh, really simple drivers. And uh, we had a bunch of cases where people actually made things very mutable and then uh, deeply regretted it and we had to retrofit immutable state objects behind a mutable UAPI just to, to take care of uh, the complexity in the code base. Another pattern is the single owner so, for example, when you have a asynchronous pr pr uh, processing, you like create some structure that encapsulates the work, and then you hand it off to the worker. And then, before you hand it off, you you're the owner, and after you've handed it over, the worker is the owner. So there's only ever one. And any time you own it, you can change it. But if you don't own it, you're not allowed to even look at it anymore. So kind of the single owner is, is a very nice pattern. Uh, ideally, you implement it with the, the work queue primitives, because like I said, they have locked up annotations, but sometimes you not need to use completions and stuff. Uh, another pattern from, from this group is reference counting, because uh, it allows you to guarantee that once the release function is called, it, it's in a special, in a way, it's a special case of the single owner pattern because the release function is guaranteed to be the single owner of of the object, and so it can destroy it without taking locks and clean it up in any order because no one else is looking at it anymore. And uh, because Rust is cool, I have to mention it. Um, essentially. Rust really excels at ownership patterns because it's part of the borrow checker. So you can encode all these, like you have exclusive ownership, you're the only one can, who can mutate uh, a structure really well in Rust. So the next level is, well, you, you couldn't like use one of the previous patterns. You actually have concurrent access and you need some kind of lock. There's a slide missing. Okay, I, I need to improvise that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and where, oh, where is it? Maybe it's. No, it's gone. This is annoying. I apologize. Something must have hidden it. And the trouble with kind of the simple lock is if you make it too small, right, you have the problem that you might need two locks to change something. And then you have increased chances for deadlocks, right? Because one code path might need to look at object A or type A and then B, and the other first at B and then at A, and then you have a deadlock, right? But you also need to make sure that you don't make it too big, because if you make it too big, you run into the problem that you're protecting your entire subsystem or your driver with a single lock, and that again means you, it's much harder to refactor your code base. Um, my experience has been that for kind of the big simple lock approach, 
or hindsight is the most reliable indicator for whether you got it right. <laughs> so unfortunately, you, know, you, you will have to like adjust and sometimes split up objects into like smaller chunks and pieces, or sometimes merge a few things together again. Uh, this unfortunately happens, but that's that's kind of like trying to pick the right size for you, your simple lock is is kind of the challenge with that. And the nice thing again, like Rust excels at this with the mutex guard. It nicely enforces that you take the big lock for your object and then you get a mutable reference. And when you drop that local variable, it, it automatically gets unlocked. So that was the missing slide and we can go to the second level, which is more fine-grained locking. And this is, this is kind of, in some cases, you need, you have like a functional lead to protect pieces of, of your data structures with smaller locks. Like, the, the, I think one of the most common patterns is if you just keep a linked list of all the objects. So you have a spin lock somewhere on your driver in the list head. And obviously, like, each object might have its own lock, but when you need to manipulate the list, like maybe move it from one to the other or, or add it or delete it, you also need to ta uh, take the, the, the spin lock that's kind of nested within. Another very common one is like in drivers, we tend to have to deal with interrupt handlers and interrupt handlers can't use mutexes, but your driver object might need a mutex because you're sleeping under that lock or you need to allocate memory. So you need to nest a spin lock, an interrupt say spin lock within your kind of object mutex for just the stuff that's shared with the interrupt handler. Uh, the next one is kind of asynchronous processing. If you have like an object and some of the work is done asynchronously. If your asynchronous worker uses the same lock, right? then you might up in the situation where one thread grabs the lock and waits for the asynchronous worker to finish. And the asynchronous worker is kind of waiting for you to release the lock, <laughs> so you have a deadlock. And so again, like, it's, it's kind of similar to the interrupt handler situation. You need to have like a, a subordinate lock which encapsulates just the data that the asynchronous worker needs. And the, the fourth one that is fairly common and I kind of talked about it already by uh, complaining about kref put mutex, is weak references. So if you shouldn't use kref put mutex to implement weak references, what should you use instead? And this is kind of the next slide. So instead of kref put mutex, what you can use is kref get on less zero. So you protect like your lookup cache with a spin lock or whatever. And then when you found your object in there, you call kref get on, get on less zero, which means if the object still exists, you get an elevated reference count. But if the reference count has already dropped to zero, it's kind of a zombie entry, which hasn't been cleaned up, and so you fail the lookup. And this means in your release function, you can just take the spin lock, remove the cache, the cache lookup entry, drop the spin lock, take the next spin lock, remove the cache lookup entry from like another cache, if you have like one on the file descriptor, one on the device, one in the subsystem, who knows. And so this essentially means with kref get on less zero, you can make re uh, weak references composable, right? And the same thing is kind of the flush work issue if you're holding the same lock that you use for protecting data consistency as for like that you're holding to synchronize with the asynchronous processing, you also can have deadlocks. And I try to, I've seen this in a bunch of places, and I try to abstract this a bit away as an anti-pattern. Essentially when you're trying to use locking for object lifetime management, so kref put mutex, essentially what the mutex does is give you a, a least object lifetime, right? And the same thing with the flush work versus the lock is kind of flush work is about synchronizing kind of the object state and lifetime, 
but the mutex is about data consistency. And my experience has been if you mix these up, you tend to have deadlocks. And what's worse is locked up natively doesn't understand cross release. There's been efforts for years to change this. And kind of lifetime issues or cross release, like code runs, there's like a completion, there's a wait completion, and that's kind of the thing that creates the dependencies. It's not like the locking critical sections. And so, in general, um, it's both way too easy to create like deadlocks when you mix up uh, locking with, with lifetime issues or transitions. It's worse that lock that doesn't even tell you. So you will only find out about these when you're in production, which is not great. And this is kind of also the reason why you really should use the most specific primitive that the kernel has, because the more specific a primitive is, the more likely it is that you can add lockdown annotations and the respective subsystem maintainer has done it for these kind of cross-release dependencies. So like Flushwork will complain, but if you hand roll this with your own completions, uh, it will not. And uh, kind of the, the slightly worse case of the second level where you're really getting into danger is when you do find green blocking for performance. But uh, in the principles, I've already talked about what you really should do and, to be honest, shouldn't do in most cases. <laughs> so the final one is where I've mostly seen bugs and not a lot of good code, at least in drivers, is when you get into the lockless tricks and, and the really fancy stuff. And this is where uh, the, the section of my blog post and talk where I'm gonna make a few people angry because I, I see, at least in drivers, I see these only as anti-patterns. And the first one is RCU. Now RCU is great, it's fast, it's awesome, but the problem or the fundamental problem where RCU gets uh, into a uh, maintainability nightmare is that fundamentally RCU works by extending the lifetime a little bit very cheaply anytime you have a read critical section. And so fundamentally RCU violates the entire you should separate object lifetime from data consistency rule. And if you just replace like a read write lock or something with RCU, you haven't done anything bad, but then people get really creative and notice that, hey, this, this thing kind of keeps the object alive for a bit. And they start exploiting that. And one, two years later, you notice that entire GPU virtual memory destruction and release code paths are somehow in their RCU uh, delayed free <laughs> because everything slowly moved in there. And you end up with synchronized RCU and other, other like delay points in really bad spots. So RCU is great, but because it fundamentally kind of mixes up lifetime with lock or consistency, it's been, in my experience, really dangerous. Uh, the next one is atomics. One thing that tricks up people a lot is, I mean, C++ has since a few years really well-defined atomic semantics. They don't match the kernel. So anyone who comes from user space gets it wrong. The other hilarious thing with a, a kernel atomics is that some kernel atomics don't have an atomic in their name. So the, I think the most uh, tricky one is the bit ops, where like set bit and test bit are the atomic versions, and the one with the double underscore are the not atomic versions, and so the relaxing code where you can be at ease is the one with the double underscore, and the one without the double underscore is the one that should freak you out and make you review things carefully. Uh, another anti pattern is all these preempt disable, local IQ, IOQ disable, like bottom half disable. For one, is um, they annoy the real time people because they have really bad defined semantics. Luckily, there's like local lock, I think it's called, there's a replacement, which has much better semantics and essentially, in my opinion, moves these code patterns from 
the, the purgatory level out into one of the good ones, essentially, like the, the level with just a simple lock. It's, it's a, in a way, it's a mix between ownership roles and the, and the, and the lock. But like the hand roll stuff is very hard to debug, understand, and maintain. And in all of these things, is sooner or later you, you need you need memory barriers. And so, I would say memory barriers are an anti-pattern in two cases. One is in some t some cases people just don't bother about them which is very obviously broken in almost all cases, or they do bother about them and then you should be really freaked out. Because my experience has been that unless you've done essentially the equivalent of a PhD in lockless algorithms, you can maybe spot bugs, but you can't prove correctness. So we have, I think, two or three of these in the DRM subsystem. We're trying to get rid of them because it turns out they're, they're, they're broken. <laughs> or we didn't, we, we aren't careful enough in like just adding the right amount of memory barriers. And so to, to close out, I figured a nice, a nice case study of, of one example from DRM, which I think worked out really well, which is the atomic mode setting. So this essentially is, is it's implemented as, transaction, as atomic transactions to your display hardware. And unlike in, in a database where usually you have tr uh, a try commit rollback approach, like with real hardware, once you start fiddling with your display, you can't really roll back because the user has seen that things are starting to turn off and stuff. So what we instead have is we have like a, com a check commit split, and the commit is not allowed to fail. And in the check phase, which could potentially run concurrently, uh, we have essentially per object locks. Uh, we achieve composability of these per object locks with the weight bound mutex graph locking, which means drivers can take these locks in any order they feel like, and that you can even like check stuff in parallel on subsets, like if you have your display hardware split up into two seats with two independent compositors running. And in the commit phase, it's pure ownership. So the, the commit phase is done with, if user space asks for it, an asynchronous worker. And essentially, once, once we've put in the new software state under the protection of the lock, actually writing the software state into hardware with the commit phase, which is not allowed to fail, right? So that, that's why we can do that, is, is pure uh, ownership rules. And uh, the subsequent transactions synchronize with completions. Unfortunately, we can't use uh, the work queue primitives because you can make networks of transactions with uh, because sometimes hardware resources are shared and things like that. And I think the part that's really nice is that at least for your standard driver, all the locking and all the ownership handover is implemented in the framework. So driver people can actually just write the MMIO sequences to light up the display, and they have a correct driver, <laughs> mostly. I mean, there's, there's some special cases where you the, you need to think about your own synchronization and stuff, but, but we have helpers for that. And yeah, so this, this is kind of, I think, a pretty good example where we achieved the second priority of making it correct um, all, almost for any dumb code. And I think it took a bit longer than I hoped for. Anyway, here's the summary, and maybe we have time for a question or two. I have like half a minute, so maybe let's stick with one question. Or maybe not. So, Daniel, thank you very much for your talk. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>